Okay, sharing now. Can you see it? Yep. Yes. Okay, so if we are all ready, let's start. So first of all, thank you very much to all the audience. So let's start and see what is behind this intentionally catchy title. <laughs> so the agenda of this talk is we will start start talking about some basic concepts around container images manifest tags and layers you might be already familiar with this but let's do a quick summary and sync then we will see what a mutant tag is how it is created how it obtains its destructive superpowers and becomes evil and starts spreading chaos and eating your family and friends <laughs> then we will focus on some issues that have can happen when deploying things uh, be it simple with Docker, Kubernetes, or about security threats that might appear. Uh, we will learn some good practices and some ways of protecting against these little mutant bastards. And apart from deployment, there can uh, also be surprises and unexpected behaviors when dealing with mutant tags inside registries. So we will show this, these issues or these deals. Finally, we will talk about support for immutable tags before moving to question and answers. <clears throat> okay, so let's go with those basic concepts. So I guess we all have the concept of registry, what a Docker or container registry is. For example, Docker IO, the default one for Docker if you don't specify one, which stores the container images. Then images in a registry are grouped into what we call repositories. So for example, the image, my image is the repository name, it could be an under an organization, something like my organization slash my image. Our repository stores different image tags, that is, different versions of that image. In the example, we have tag one and tag two in the my image repository, so we have two different images, each tag for every image. So when a container is creative, what we are doing is we are pulling a copy of the image, the corresponding tag of the image, from the repository and creating a new container using that image. Uh, multiple containers can share the same image, but the downloaded copy of the image remains the same for containers. This is important. Every container has an additional read rate layer on top of the image, so any changes made inside the container are kept local to the container. <clears throat> this layer is called the container layer, and in fact, there is not a single layer. There are two container layers, one that is created read-only for configuration files like resolve.conf and others. And then there's, there is the real read-write layer on top of that where your changes are persisted. Okay, so what is an image exactly? An image really is just a manifest file that describes the image configuration, the start to parameters and others, and a set of file system layers that compose together create the root, the root file system of the image. For this container instance, its root file system is created from uh, this image. The way these layers are composed together using overlay file systems, copy and write mechanisms, subvolumes, snapshots, etc., is a complex topic itself, but it's not relevant right now, so we can skip it. The interesting thing also is the layers can be shared uh, between shared and reused between different images. The layer thickest is the same as long as both layers have the same content. This is very good for saving storage and bandwidth when pulling and pushing images from the registry. So layers are stored as binary blobs in the registry, indexed by their content thickest. The manifest document itself is also stored the same as layers in the registry. It is also a binary blob indexed by digest. And in fact, um, inside the repository, the set of images, the registry stores just a list of links to the corresponding manifest files. Tags are just pointers to the corresponding manifest, to the corresponding manifest digest. We can see in this diagram, like every image has a digest corresponding to the manifest. The manifest inside has several layers that are also stored in the um, repository and tags are just pointers to these manifest files. Let's make that clear. Okay. We know the basic concepts. We know what a tag is. So what is a mutant tag? 
we could call it a mutable duck instead of a mutant duck, but really, mutant sounds much cooler. Would the X-Men rock if they were a bunch of mutable people wearing funny clothes? Sure not. So beware the mutant ducks. So what is a mutant duck? Let's see an example. We start by building an image locally, like my image clone duck one, and we push that image to a repository. When the image is pushed, the layers are pushed to the registry, the manifest is created, the manifest dequest is calculated, and a tag point into that manifest, the dequest ring, is created too. We have it in the slide. So when we need to pull this image, the opposite process is used. We ask the registry for the tag, tag one, it is resolved to the manifest dequest, the one in blue in the slide, the dequest is pulled to obtain the manifest, and then the image configuration and layers that are referenced in the manifest are pulled in turn, so we have the complete image pulled in our local system. Now, what happens if we build a different image? In this example, just the top layer changed, but the two bottom layers are the same, and we then push this new image to the registry, but using the same tag, tag one in this example. The process is repeated. We only need to push the new layer, the two bottom layers, the blue and the green, uh, should be already in the repository, so there is no need to push them again. Uh, we can check by the guest before pushing, and this will save us some uh, precious bandwidth. And only the new layer is pushed to the registry, saving storage also. When the push process is finished, a new manifest is created with a different guest because the manifest content is different, and then tag one now is updated to point to this new manifest, the one in gray that we here that we can see in the slide. So the tag has mutated now. If we create a third image and push, the same happens again, and the tag mutates to a new and different version of the image. So basically, this is a, a mutation of the tag. Oops. Sorry, I think. Okay, I skipped. One slide, sorry. So it is also worth noting that the old manifests are still available in the registry. So you can retrieve them using the manifest guest instead of the image tag when executing the, the pull command or when referencing the image. Um, as you can see, the, the guest in this example are truncated for simplicity, um, for simplicity and for uh, laziness. I just saved myself some time typing and making a longer guess. So I will reuse the same guess for the rest of the lives if you don't mind. So as you can see in the example, we can use my image at SHA256, a colon, one AB, etc., to pull the first image, then my image at SHA, etc., to pull the second one, and either my image colon tag one or my image at SHA256, etc., to pull the third one. Also, again, worth noting that multiple tags can point to the same manifest. In the example, you can see that the image tag one and my image other tag refer both to the same image at this point, although they could mutate. So, okay, mutant tags exist. They are among us. Are they useful? Do they have use cases? Are they evil or can they their superpowers save the world? Obviously, mutable or mutant tags are useful. They have multiple use cases, you might already know. For example, having latest, the default tag if you don't specify a tag for image. It is always pointing, or it should always point to the latest version of an image, or you can have variants like Alpine, Slim, or similar that always point or should point to the corresponding latest version of these image variants. It is also quite common to use tags to track versions in different environments, like having dev, prod tags, etc., updated when a new version is deployed to one of these environments. Also, for version in simplicity, it's also common to have some tags like a colon one or 2.0 that is really an alias to a minor version or a minor patch version. So the user can rely on pulling the latest major version with no unexpected behavior or configuration changes, but making sure that you are getting the, um, the latest 
a minor version with all the books and all the security fixes corresponding to the minor versions. So this is our typical use cases. Well, so we have seen that mutant tags can be useful. They are not that evil. But let's now learn some issues you can find if you are not careful when you manage your deployments. Well, let's see an example. For simplicity, uh, we will be talking about Docker Run, but let's imagine any case where an image is deployed using a tag that can mutate, like uh, via Docker Compose file or any orchestrator or different container runtimes, not just Docker. In this example, a developer executes a container, my image, latest locally, and right now latest is pointing at a version, for example, version 1.1 right now. Okay, then a couple of hours later, once the developer uh, finished with the deployment configuration, uh, he pushes the configuration to a Git repository, then another developer checks the configuration in his laptop and runs the same container, but is it really the same container? The maintainer of this container might have pushed version 1.2 meanwhile and update latest to point to 1.2 instead of 1.1. Now the container is running a different image, so the behavior might change. Then tomorrow, after a catch cleanup in the local host or when the container is deployed in production in a different server, the tag has mutated again and now it's version 2.0 instead of version 1.x. What happens? Very bad things can happen. For example, the configuration file format might not work due to breaking compatibility changes, uh, some plugins are not supported, etc. These are real cases that <laughs> we have suffered. So you might be deploying a totally different version in production if you are not careful with these things. A similar issue can be reproduced in Kubernetes, which is a container orchestrator, basically. So it can happen whenever a pod is scheduled in a different node, if the image is not reused from the cache, or for example, if new nodes can join to the cluster starting with an empty cache, or if a node is recycled, okay, in that case, different pods can be deployed. Let's see, this is a very basic example that I will demo to reproduce the issue. To simulate it, we cordon one of the nodes to avoid pod from being scheduled in that node. And then we define a deployment with a couple of replicas for my image latest. And then in the deployment, we include some anti-pod affinity rules. So we make sure that two pods cannot be deployed or rescheduled on the same node. So we create a deployment, a new pod is created in node one and a second pod fails to be a schedule because there are no available nodes in these two node cluster that comply with the anti-affinity rules. Node one has one pod running and node two is cordon, so no pods can be a schedule. Okay, then meanwhile, a different image version is pushed to the registry using the same latest stuff. And then we uncordon node two to allow scheduling again. So the pod that was failing now is pulled from the registry in that node and we pull the new mutated version of latest with the first from node one. So we have two different pods running from the same deployment and we end up having two different versions of the pod. Uh, I have recorded the demo so you can see it in action. Let me check where it is here. Okay, oops. Sorry, I missed the screen. <laughs> oh. This is going quite slow, sorry. I think it's here. Okay, so let's, sorry guys, this is going a bit slow. Okay, the idea is we tag an image which is test good with the tag mutant and push it to the repository. Now we check a running cluster, we have three nodes and cordon one of the nodes. Now, Scheduling is disabled for that node. We can check this deployment. It is going to deploy the test mutant and it has some pod anti-affinity rules in there. So let's apply this deployment. It is created and now if we check the pods, we have two pods running and the third one is pending. It cannot be deployed. We check the logs. I am good. The other pod is also good. And now we describe the pod that is pending and we can see that it cannot be scheduled 
because uh, there are pains that the pod didn't tolerate. So now let's change and retag mutant using a different image, the bad one. Let's push it to the local registry. And now let's encode on the node and let's see what happens. Now we have three pods running, but if we check the logs from the pod that was just scheduled, we can see that the pod ran a different program. I am bad. The other ones are, I am good. Also, if we describe the pods, I grab for SHA-256, we can see that the decays for two of these pods is different because they are running a different version of the image. You can see in there. Okay. Okay, let's move back to the slides. Great. Okay, most of the issues so far are related to bad timing, unexpected updates, etc., but not to malicious activity. Let's see a case where an attacker could exploit a TalkTow bug to run malicious software in your cluster. TalkTow stands for time of check versus time of use. So this bug, this bug happens if checks are done in a different moment than the usage of the resource. Let's explain it. We have a safe and nice image we are using from a public registry, and we are going to deploy that image again, or all frame my image latest in our cluster. As a good security practice, because we all like to be safe, we have configured, uh, well, as we are using public images that we don't trust, uh, we set up an admission controller in our Kubernetes. Uh, so we trigger an image scan on every pod creation or update. In this case, the image scanner receives the image and tag that is being used for the container in the pod, pulls the image from the registry, the image is pulled, no vulnerabilities are found, so everything is good. We, the admission controller, admits the pod into the cluster. The pod resource is created. Meanwhile, and here appears a risk condition, someone, the, uh, the latest tag in this example is mutated because someone pushes a different version, either by mistake, a version upgrade, or maybe because an attacker uploads a version containing some malicious code or behavior. Okay, so when the pod is scheduled finally to run in a node after admission, it pulls the image from the registry, but the malicious image is now used for the container and executed by passing the image scanner. So what we have running in the cluster is a potentially dangerous image running in there. Chaos, the end of the world is coming, fortunately. <laughs> so let's reason about some ways we can prevent and protect from these tag mutations. First, let's uh, think if these issues are easy to reproduce. Really, they are very easy to reproduce. Developers are pushing new images all the time. So it is just a matter of bad luck if you hit an unexpected image update that breaks something in your deployment. And about race condition, let's see how the image push process works. First, all, all layers, which can be big and slow, are pushed to the registry using multiple API calls and posting binary data. But the last the push process, the one is the manifest and updates mutates, the task to point to the new request is very quick and it is very easy to use any uh, registry API client and block the last step of the push until the right moment. So you wait and you try to win that uh, race condition to push the malicious image in the right moment. Okay, so ways to mitigate these problems. Well, apart from the obvious ways like using digital signatures in the images to verify they are from trusted sources or have a strict control over where you are pulling images from, uh, which are all standard security measures, there are some good practices that can save you uh, from trouble. For example, try to avoid tags like, like latest or similar for deploying in production or for whatever, it is not uh, just a quick test. Try to stick to more stable tags, like a specific version tags, although there is no warranty that this cannot mutate. <laughs> Furthermore, latest, the latest tag is just a convention. It is not guaranteed even to exist or really point to the latest existing version. It can point to a version three years old if the developer didn't update it. 
if you want to make sure uh, that you stick to the same image, then you can use the image request, like uh, at SHA-256, a uh, column, and the request of the image. That warrants that the image will always be the same. No way to mutate it. You can use the command docker image uh, dash dash request, image request in the list, or you can, for example, inspect the pod once rest of the image, among many other ways. Uh, in Kubernetes, also, the tag to the guest resolution is done after the pod is scheduled uh, and the image is pulled. If it was resolved before creating the pod resource, it could save us from some of these issues. Also, note, note that Kubernetes has different image pool policies for the pods. So you can use always to always download from the registry or different image policies to reuse the, the node cache. So about the Tocto time of check, time of use issue, we are developing image scanner controller using OPA as an evaluation engine, by the way, and see image uh, scanner as image scanner that does not only validate the pod, but it also mutates the spec of the pod. So the biggest is used instead of the tag of the pod. So this makes sure that the scanned image is the same that it is being scheduled later. Don't worry because the original image and tag uh, is kept in annotation for reference, so it is not uh, it is not lost. So for this uh, mutating admission controller, it's a mutation versus mutation battle. Let's mutate the pod to protect from the mutating tags. Okay, but the issues are not only in the deployments. There are also some pains we can suffer in the registry itself, especially in case you need to manage your own registry. Let's uh, first understand the background on how the registry stores our image. Uh, this is a bit deep. Um, I'll try to go fast because we don't have much time. You can go back later and check the details in case you are interested or just ask me. So here uh, I am talking about the open source vanilla Docker registry implementation that you can deploy and use yourself. And it is, by the way, used by hardware, for example, but the implementation of the storage might differ in other registry solutions, especially in commercial solutions. As we already commented, every layer is a bluff with, uh, which is addressable by its content. A SHA-256 request is calculated for every bluff in the registry, and the manifest, which is just a JSON document containing information about the image composition and the layers composing the image is quite the same as it is also stored as a blog and content address, right? So there is really not much difference in how a manifest a layer are stored. Here you can see what a manifest uh, file looks like in case you don't know, it's a simple JSON with media types, sizes, uh, the guest of the configuration file and the guest of the layers. In this example, it's a very simple image with only one layer, but usually you, this, this could contain multiple layers. Okay, so what happens? Supposing that you deploy a registry and use a local file system as a storage backend, because you can use S3 buckets and other options too. This is what happens under the hoods when a new image is pushed to the registry. So supposing all the storage is down this prefix at the top, a base pad like the dollar data, then the registry creates a structure of directories and files under slash registry slash docker slash registry v2. So this, all these paths below are relative to, to this directory. So when we push test a colon mutant under the library project, in this case, it is called a project in Harbor. In Docker Hub, it is usually called organization or user then the following files and directories are created. First, you can see that under repositories library, which is the name of the project, test, which is the name of the image, manifest, tag, mutant, current, link, there is one file that contains the request of the manifest pointed by that tag. So it is kind of a link, but in the content of the file. Then similarly under repositories, name of the project, repo, manifest, tags, tag name, index, SHA-256, and then the request, this is truncated for clarity, you have another link file similar to the previous one with the content of the request. Then under repository library test manifest revisions, SHA-256, again, you have another similar file. Here you can see a cut of the content of these files. And finally, under blobs, 
SHA-256, a prefix with the two letters, and then the DKS slash data, you have the manifest content itself, the binary data of the manifest. Also, there could be similar bluffs for, for the layers. Okay, well, what happens if we push a mutated tag? Well, we can see that we push a mutated tag, the current slash link file is modified, and now pointing to the new image manifest, manifest file. Under index slash SHA-256, the old DGS remains the same, but a new one is created. And again, similar under manifest revisions, a new link file to the new one is created. In blobs SHA-256, the old manifest remains, and uh, new blobs are created for the manifest and the layers. So where are I going to go? Uh, recapping for each mutation, there is a blob for the manifest file, there is a link to the current manifest for that tag, and then there are also links to the corresponding manifest blobs. And important, we keep an index of the current and the past manifest for all the images. Otherwise, if this index was not kept, it could not be possible to track the manifest corresponding to a repository. It could not be possible to pull by the guest. So what happens with the garbage collector? Garbage collector works as a mark and sweep. First, it scans all the manifest on each repo, marks reference layers, and finally sweeps the one that are not referenced by any manifest. This releases, this releases the space of layers that are not used anymore by any image in the registry. What is the problem? When we mutate tags, we keep all the past manifest in the registry. So these layers are still being marked as in use, and the garbage collector is unable to reclaim that space. In order to reclaim this space, we need to remove the repository completely or have low level access to the storage. Okay. Furthermore, there are some inconsistencies, or at least that is my opinion, and many people agree, on the in the current registry v2 API. So for example, removing an image is done by the guest, but this thing is done by tag. So it's not easy to find all manifest. Uh, you need to access the storage to do this. This also can cause some unexpected behavior issues. For example, in Harvard, there was a bug that hopefully, uh, fortunately, is fixing 1.11, that when you remove one tag, at the removal is done by the guest, it could remove all the tags using the same uh, the guest. There are some ongoing and recent discussions on these topics, and you have a couple of link links in here. So, and this is nearly finishing, mutant tags can be dangerous, but they are also handy and useful. Should we use immutable tags instead? Well, some registries like Harbor uh, or ECR uh, and probably others support making tags immutable, or you can check in your CI CD pipeline before pushing to make sure that you are not generating an existing one. Okay, so there are ways to make them immutable. The question is should they be mutable or immutable? Well, mutability is useful, it is handy but it can be dangerous if you are not aware and prepared to handle it. So two quotations, with great power comes great responsibility and knowledge is power. So take these two principles, unleash the power of mutant tags and apply your knowledge to keep them under control. So thank you very much for listening. I had some stickers and some uh, t-shirts here. You, you can come here and pick one and, oh, so, sorry, this is virtual, so just take one virtual dessert. And thank you very much. Share your questions here or in the chat of the Slack. I'll try to answer them.